Thank you for joining us. Mike, it's really nice to have you here. Well, Casey, Casey it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here at a really exciting conference. I've been to many of them, and this is far and away both the largest and the most diverse, which really makes it a very interesting experience. So, Mike, I'm not going to read the thousand-word bio that's on the web about you, but I think just for our audience, you have extensive experience in higher education, and just one way of summing up who you are and what you do, Forbes recently cited you as... Uh, one of higher education's top 10 influencers. Uh, for an attorney in higher education, somebody who doesn't wear a tweed jacket, congratulations. Well, uh, I, I think that's a good thing. I think I've tried very hard yeah. over the years to do more than just uh, be an attorney in the sense of answering questions. I've also tried to raise questions and find solutions that may be a little bit different from what the uh, the ordinary would be. And in, in education, that's a really easy thing to do because the field is changing just so rapidly. And uh, the law, the regulations, the rules that surround it are just are constantly changing and uh, being forced to change because the, the environment is changing so rapidly. Education is not a bricks and mortar industry anymore. It's a technology industry. Let's talk about some of that change. Um, this is a conference that labels itself as an innovation summit. So from the perspective of some of the, the legal changes that affect innovation in K-12 and especially high, the higher ed, which is your area of expertise, what are some of those issues where attention must be paid? Well, I think there are two categories of regulation that we have to worry about. There are those regulations that stimulate innovation, that make people think about, okay, here's an issue. How do we find a a solution and uh, disability is a really good example. Uh, when when the uh, the internet opened up and when e-learning opened up, everybody thought this was the solution for individuals with disabilities. This was going to solve the problem. They don't have to go to a classroom. They can they can stay at home or stay wherever they are, and the education comes to them. Uh, the problem is they have to be able to use the technology. And that's very difficult. And that's posed some tremendous technological uh, challenges. What it's also done is created a whole industry of providing so, uh, disabil solutions for people with disabilities to enable them to use e-learning equal to what you get if, you're, if you don't have a disability, you can go to a classroom. And the Department of Justice has been very, very strict in telling institutions, uh, if you're offering uh, courses and you're offering them via telecommunications, you had better make them friendly for, for disabilities. So, so that's where the regulation has been a, uh, a stimulus to, to innovation. Uh, where but, but there's also this tension. I'm thinking about the TEACH Act. Sure. And, and you know, at least the policy councils and the various constituencies in Washington, um, the advocates on behalf of those with disabilities saying we need more if you will, the established order saying, we're making good progress, trust us, I think is a fair way to kind of render that down. But that's that's the history of regulation. Yeah. I mean, there are those who are, who are under the tent tend to be comfortable that the tent's big enough. Mm -hmm. And those who are outside of the tent are banging on the flaps and saying, let us in and do what's needed to, to accommodate us. Yeah. That's a natural tension. And it's a good tension. And again, if you're in technology and if you, you feel that the technology of education has to be centered on what learners need and what educators need, yeah. then it's it's a good thing. And the tension is a good thing. It, there, there is a balance. I mean, one of the, the problems is you can't just say, okay, we're going to solve this. We're going to throw infinite money at the problem and we're going to make, we're going to eliminate any possible discrepancies between what a person with a disability has to deal with and what a person without the disability. That's probably not, not possible. Mm -hmm. But you strike a balance, and that tension is a necessary tension. Uh, let's talk about how that plays out in terms of governmental action. For example, the Department of Education recently uh, started promoting open source o uh, OER textbooks the last month or two. And yet one of the big issues with OER is just that issue about ADA compliance for populations with disability. So on one hand, here you have a resource that hopefully will provide either free or very low-cost course materials for college students. And yet, at least in their initial release, you know, whether they come directly from the department or from agencies or organizations working with department funds or under the department's if you will, support, you know, that those first releases may not, in fact, be accessible to the very audience, one part of the very audience and population they intended to serve. 
The Department of Education has a history, and I think all government agencies have a his history, of coming up with ideas that are about 75% thought through. Yeah. And it's the other 25% that uh, present the challenge. Uh, open source uh, cost materials, reducing the, the fairly dramatically rising cost of, of text materials is a really good idea. It's a really important idea. Uh, but it creates a new problem because yeah. that now you have a class of students who uh, don't have to pay for their materials and you have another class of students who aren't getting that same benefit. And I can guarantee you that there's going to be a lawsuit uh, filed on behalf of students who are not getting that benefit who claim that they have an entitlement to it. You, you cited the, the issue of access for disabilities as one example, and you said there were two. What there's another part of this coin uh, of the area of regulation and government action. Well, it's with it's innovation. The, well, and I, what I was saying is that the the disabilities is an example of where there's an a incentive to innovate, mm -hmm. and the the disincentive side, where regulation can stop innovation or certainly delay it. Uh, the most obvious is the. Uh, almost 100-year reliance on the credit hour yeah. as the basis for measuring student achievement. That's particularly significant in higher education because all of the federal student aid funding is tied to, to a measurement of essentially how long a student has been sitting in a classroom. And what we discovered is that what we don't really care that much about is how long the student is sitting there. What we care about is what the student has learned. And the, the best line of this I've heard is that we finally uh, discovered that we've been measuring the wrong end of the student. And I think the issue here is that so much has come up, and so much has been developed in terms of competency-based learning and learning that is based on measurable outcomes and on adjusting learning to the, the capabilities and the skills and the learning styles of the individual. But you have to hammer that into a little box called a credit hour. So you have institutions like Western Governors University, which was the really the founder of right. the competency-based um, movement, and I'm proud to have been part of the team that put that together. And yet it has had to convert its programs into a credit-based format for no reason other than the fact that that's the regulatory framework. And, and that's ridiculous. So we're, we're saying we have this really major breakthrough in how we provide education and how we, we provide learning, but we have a regulatory framework that says, well, that's really inconvenient for those who have to disperse federal funds, so we're going to keep it. Uh, the other example, in terms of online learning, is the one where the states are actually erecting barriers to keep others out. Seems to be, uh, in terms of, can I bring my online program from Ohio to Indiana, from California someplace else? I'm mindful, for example, that uh, in the early days of the University of Phoenix, I lived in California at the time, uh, there were campuses that made every effort to keep Phoenix out in terms of, at that time, uh, satellite campuses, let alone online. In fact, they were doing the same well, thing. The, the states have always had that. I mean, yeah. the, uh, when the University of uh, Phoenix uh, was developed, and when they started branching campuses, mm -hmm. physical campuses, uh, you know, a Phoenix campus coming into California was something like an invasion of medflies. And you did everything possible to, to right. stop that. The states have always had the power, and they still do, to say, if you want to open a campus, if you want to have classrooms in, in our state, you've got to, you have to meet our requirements. And that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, the states have ultimate responsibility for consumer protection. They have ultimate responsibility for education. But... What's happened with online, and this is something that, that started in the, in the 1980s when uh, distance learning was television, and states started saying, wait, we're having these broadcasts coming in from out of state of students enrolling in courses at out of state institutions. What do we do about it? And out of that came an effort to try to provide a uniform model of, uh, of regulation. And the states and the accreditors got together and they said, this is a serious problem. We need to figure out a way that we can rely on what the home state and the home accreditor says is a valid program. The accreditors got together and to their considerable credit, and this is the regional accreditors, they said, okay, if you're accredited in one region, that accreditation works anywhere in the country. You, like your currency, full it's, faith and credit. It's full faith and credit, exactly. And the states got together and this, the, the high regulation states said, 
we have no problem if everybody else has regulations just as tough as ours, we're happy. And the law regulation states say, we don't care who comes in because we don't have any regulations. Right. And of course, the whole process completely fell apart. Mm -hmm. And it was not until just a few years ago, probably five or six years, that the states actually got together under tremendous pressure arising out of online learning and said, we have to have a better way. And the states, in fact, created what's called uh, SARA, the State uh, Authorization Reciprocity Agreement, and there's a National Council for SARA. And two-thirds of the states have now signed up, and the states agree that they will accept a home state approval of a state that's a SARA member, and in return for which the home state takes responsibility for ensuring consumer protection of every student enrolled in that program, regardless of where they live. Now, the states have to agree to certain levels of oversight. They have to have a certain regulatory regime. But this is a solution to a problem that's been around for 35 years. Yeah. And finally, the pressure got so great from the pervasiveness of online learning, and, and not, not so much the you know, the big uh, schools that were doing, but everyone was doing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the big institutions, the UMUCs and others, could afford to spend a million dollars a year on state approvals. Small institutions couldn't. Right. And they were being forced completely out of the market. And they discovered that they could bring pressure to bear and they could make this change. And this is, I think, one of the great accomplishments mm -hmm. in changing a regulatory framework to accommodate the new technology of learning. I want to come back to the issue of innovation. This is an innovation summit, self-declared. There's a lot of showcasing of innovative approaches to different parts of K-12 higher education. If I'm one of those aspiring education entrepreneurs, above and beyond just sort of the, the corporate law and everything else, what are a couple of things that I really need to understand about trying to do business and do business well as an, as an innovator in higher education? Well, this is a, a mantra that I, I, I offer up to tech entrepreneurs, because their first reaction, we're, we're not regulated, we're entrepreneurs, we're in California, this, none of this stuff applies to us. And my answer is very simple. You're not directly regulated, although, by the way, that's changing. The, the new privacy rules that are coming out in states all over the country are, are being applied to third-party providers, not just the institutions. But you're selling into a highly regulated industry, whether it's K-12 or higher education. And if you're not compliant with those regulations, if you're not doing what those regulations require, you don't have a market. I mean, your institutions are going to ask you whether you're ADA compliant. Your yep. institutions are going to ask you whether you meet privacy rules and, and a whole host of those issues. So those innovators who are also aware of the regulatory environment are going to prosper. And those innovators who ignore it are going to run into walls. My sense of a lot of the innovators, in fact, though, is that they're, they're coming out of a personal experience. Some, you know, more and more, many of the folks here, this is not, oh, I want to be an innovator, education looks interesting. It's They've had direct experience. Teach for America, they've been in a college classroom, they see a vacuum, they see an opportunity. Yet, for many of them also, it's their personal experience isn't necessarily the experience of the need of their clients. You know, they're often at a distance and it's kind of well-intentioned, but not necessarily well-grounded. Well, I mean, that's that's a, an issue of innovation generally. Yeah. And uh, it's probably an issue of uh, the education industry generally, because most educators don't necessarily come out of the backgrounds of their learners. Right. And there are not a whole lot of, uh, of, of educational leaders who came out of, you know, really poor families in the hood or really poor rural families and, you know, don't have that experience, don't have that direct understanding of mm -hmm. what the uh, the client is about. But that's that's typical in, in every field. It's typical in medicine. Uh, it's typical in law, uh, in any profession. I, I think what we're learning is the huge difference among learners that, and I think the whole notion of adaptive learning, the whole notion that you you teach to the learner, you don't teach to the curriculum. Right. Uh, and, and again, that has technology just spray painted all over it. We've got to come, we're almost at the end of our time. I want to 
be conscious of one question we got uh, from the audience. And that is uh, circling back to your comment about SARA. How do states maintain consumer protection under SARA if they have to trust other states to do essentially to have the same standards? Well, you suggested otherwise, that, that that's a very difficult process. Well, first of all, it, that's not strictly true. A state always retains its own consumer protection law. And if a, if a student uh, is defrauded by an institution, the state's own laws remain fully in force and effect. There's no ceding of that state authority. What Sarah says is that we can, that a state that is a Sarah participant, that is it has met the same standards that all of the states have agreed to, that an institution in that state which meets that state's requirements doesn't again have to go through the same review process in the foreign state, in the state where, where the students are enrolled. The state where the student is enrolled is not giving up its authority. It's simply saying, we're not going to put the institution through the same hoops because we trust the other state to have vetted the institution. The institution goes off the rails. The state has every authority to do exactly what it does today. It takes away no state authority whatsoever. It simply reduces the burden on the institutions and on the states. So you don't have 40 states doing the same review of the same institution. Great. Mike, we're at the end of our time. I want to thank you for joining us to our audience. Uh, we're going to be right back. Our next person up is Lou Pliese, who's the Senior Innovation Fellow at Arizona State University. My thanks to Michael Goldstein, the co-chair of the Higher Education Practice at Cooley, for joining us for this conversation today from San Diego at the ASU GSV Innovation Conference. Mike, thank you again. Casey, thank you very much.